Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 311th episode, it is our last day of SVP coverage. We have a whole grab bag. It would be the potpourri session if we were on Jeopardy because it's stuff that didn't fit in any of the other sessions. If you can't tell, we've been watching a lot of Jeopardy. Game shows are really comforting right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there is some fantastic stuff. It's not just like the refuse. And I think it's great because it is really indicative of how dinosaurs are in so many different areas of science and paleontology and things that we can learn from them. There's some really cool biomechanics studies, some stuff about early birds and how they evolved and what we learned from dinosaurs in that way and, and lots and lots of other categories too. So I'm excited to talk about it. We also have some news from around the world and we have our dinosaur of the day, Repetosaurus. But before we get into all of that, really quickly, I want to thank some of our patrons because they are the engine that keeps the I Know Dino machine running. And this week, I'd like to thank Morgan Eklov, Greg, Daniel McGill, Rohan, Joaquin, Ranger Chris from Dino for Hire, the Tolver family, Red Sox Rex, Kelly, and Ricky. Yeah, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate all of your support and it helps us in so many ways. So if you want to join our growing community of dinosaur enthusiasts, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. We got all kinds of cool rewards. We do. And I'm also, before we go into our news, just going to give a quick public service announcement, <laughs> even though we're not real radio. Sometimes I feel like doing a PSA. And this one is, if you're wondering if any rumors are true, because there is an insane amount of misinformation going on in the world right now, go to Snopes.com. It is my favorite source for figuring out what's going on and what rumors are true or false or haven't been validated one way or another. They're very unbiased. They're fantastic. We met one of the original founders of this website at a conference a couple years ago, and they really know their stuff. So Snopes.com is great. If you hear a rumor about anything, like one of them was Disneyland is going to move to Texas. <laughs> they had that on there because they cover satire and stuff too. So yeah, Snopes.com is good. Jumping into our SVP coverage, our first set of talks are going to be all biomechanics and functional morphology, which if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know is one of my favorite categories. I love biomechanics and especially dinosaur biomechanics because it's so cool that we can figure out how dinosaurs moved just by looking at their bones and other fossils. The first couple articles I'm going to talk about are about T-Rex which should not be surprising because T-Rex is one of the favorite animals of biomechanics studies. They have such crazy strong jaws. They have really weirdly disproportionately long legs compared to a lot of other predators. And of course, they're just one of the coolest dinosaurs. So everyone likes to study them. The first study that I'm going to talk about was by Pasha von Bielert. And they were looking at the OWS which stands for the optimal walking speed of T-Rex, and it's defined by the speed at which walking uses the least energy, which is a really likely speed, if you can figure out that speed, for their most common walking speed. If you think about how evolution is optimized, it makes sense that your walking speed is going to be the walking speed that uses the least energy. For example, when you move from point A to B, you probably walk slowly if you're not in a hurry because expending the extra energy isn't worth it if you're just moving around in the course of your daily business. You probably don't skip or run or do any other kind of weird extra motion. You just do the minimal amount of effort you can to walk around. If you walk slower than that, does that take more effort? Yeah, because what ends up happening is there's a sort of rhythm and it's sort of like a resonance. So if you think about like a spring bouncing or anything like that, when you're walking, you get into a resonance like that. So you st you put the one foot down and it kind of naturally pulls your back foot up and you go in a rhythm like that. Whereas if you're going too slowly, you have to like kind of absorb all the energy on each step and it's less optimal. So mm. there, there's this in-between, not too slow, not too fast speed, which is optimal. It also kind of reminds me of driving an electric car because there's a thing called hypermiling and there's an optimal driving speed you can have too, which has to do with wind resistance. And it's usually like 20 miles an hour because if you go slower, just you use energy 
just as a human being alive <laughs> or as a car just having the systems running. I was thinking about when you and I take walks together and you have to go a little slower than you'd like and I have to go a little faster than I'd like. Yes. So it is different. One of the big impacts on the optimal walking speed is the length of the leg. And that's what they usually focus on with things like T-Rex. They'll look at the tracks that we found where it looks like they're T-Rex footprints. And then they'll look at the length of the leg and say, okay, to swing that far and we think the leg weighed about this much and is this long then this is probably the optimal walking speed. But these researchers came up with a new technique. What they were looking at instead of the leg was looking at the tail. So that obviously doesn't apply to humans, but it works with dinosaurs. The cool thing about the tail is that when observing modern animals that have their tail off the ground, they move in a periodic motion along with the legs. It kind of sways from side to side, and it is in that same sort of resonance. Like when you're watching a dog walk? Yeah, uh, pretty much any animal with a, a longer tail, probably not cats because cats don't seem to abide by any rules ever, but <laughs> a lot of animals that have tails sort of sway them from side to side when they walk. The benefit to looking at tails is that they have a lot of ligament attachment points and there's less uncertainty with ligaments in a tail than there are with muscles. And that's because ligaments leave these big marks on the bone where they attach. There's big processes sticking off. So you can estimate the size of them. You can estimate where they attach. And we're pretty confident that we know the general elasticity and stiffness of ligaments. Whereas with muscles, it's more based on the weight, which is a little bit harder to estimate sometimes. So what they picked was they used Trix the T-Rex, one of the most famous T-Rex specimens in Europe. Its tail is 6.3 meters long and is relatively complete, which is why they picked it. That's over 20 feet of tail. It's a lot of tail. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen a depiction of a T-Rex, it's not a real skinny tail either. There's a lot of meat on that tail and a lot of ligaments inside it. <laughs> What they ended up doing in their model was they split that tail into five functional segments connected by springs, at least mathematically. They didn't really build it out. And that way they could simulate a sort of articulated tail moving a little bit, sort of bouncing around. And then you could see where the speed needed to be in order for it to kind of bounce in a natural rhythm from side to side. What they ended up with was an optimal walking speed of about 1.39 meters per second, or about five kilometers an hour. Pretty fast. It's not really that fast. Humans, ratites, elephants, horses, and giraffes are all in between 1 and 1.4 meters per second. So this is, yeah, at the higher end of that, but it's not ridiculously high. And there mm -hmm. have been some estimates in the past where people say, well, their legs are so long and they're so big that they were probably just cruising, going like 10 miles an hour all the time. But in actuality, it looks like they probably walked when they were just walking casually the same speed we walk. Hmm, that's funny to think of a T-Rex walking casually. Yeah, <laughs> just strolling around, you know. <laughs> so nonchalant. Exactly. Maybe this slower speed is beneficial because then you can keep an eye out for carry-on or something like that. Yeah, actually, that's a good point because if they were scavenging, you want to be at that optimal walking speed. You don't want to be running around because you need to conserve energy if you're if you're just strolling. Mm-hmm. It's also kind of funny because I think in every depiction I've seen of T-Rex in a movie, their walking speed is really fast compared to a human's. Like, I'm just imagining a T-Rex walking and a person like Jeff Goldblum walking next to it, and they wouldn't be going the same speed. The T-Rex almost always is depicted as going really quickly. Unless they suspect a human's around and then they go real slow. Yeah, that's true. Real sneaky. <laughs> it's worth spending the extra energy when you can snatch up a lawyer or something. <laughs> And just to confirm that, they pointed out that the previous estimates of large theropods were in the two to three meters per second range based on legs, not tails. So about twice as fast as what they came up with. So it's another way to look at it. Apparently it hasn't been done before. So I think it's something worth looking at. And it would be really good if you combine the two, look at the leg and the tail and see if when you have them in the same system, if that does anything if maybe the leg optimal walking speed is slightly different, maybe slightly higher and the tail is slightly lower, so it might be in between. I'm not sure. The next talk about T-Rex was by Joe Peterson, and it was about T-Rex bite force, the other <laughs> favorite thing of biomechanics looking at T-Rex. 
In this study, they were looking at a juvenile T-Rex rather than an adult T-Rex. We all know that as adults, T-Rex had jaws that were so strong they could easily crush bone and break it into pieces. But whether or not juvenile T-Rex could do that is the question being sought here. And based on scientists thinking that the juveniles filled a different ecological niche, my guess is no. Yeah, you're on the right track. Also, they're just a lot smaller with less muscle. So that would presumably make it more difficult. And they also had narrower and more blade-like teeth that are more similar to other non-tyrannosauroid theropods, or at least other adult non-tyrannosauroid. Obviously, T-Rex had tyrannosauroid teeth (laughs) because it is a tyrannosauroid, whether it was a juvenile or an adult. But say a juvenile T-Rex tooth looks a little bit more like a allosaurus adult tooth than it does like an adult T-Rex tooth. So narrower teeth. In order to test what kind of bite forces they had, they took a really interesting sort of backwards approach. Again, we're kind of looking at new ways to solve the problem. Rather than looking at a biomechanical model for how hard they could bite and, you know, what kind of muscles might have been on the skull, instead they started with evidence of puncture marks and attempted to back calculate how strong of a bite the juvenile T-Rex would have needed in order to create that puncture mark. They used the specimen known as Jane, from the Burpee Museum in Washington. And it's a pretty popular juvenile tyrannosauroid because it's in really good shape. Don't some people think Jane's a nanotyrannus? I think maybe, but that's not the holotype that people have called nanotyrannus. That one's over in Cleveland. Mm. But it is sometimes considered nanotyrannus. That's a good point. They did a scan of Jane in order to get the complete exact teeth modeled from it. And then they 3D printed tooth replicas using a cobalt chromium alloy. So these are very, very strong teeth, probably a lot stronger than a real tooth would be, I would suspect. But that wasn't really the point of it. They wanted to see how hard something had to bite in order to get into a bone. They weren't interested in if the tooth was going to break or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, these videos were crazy. Yeah, they're really cool. What they ended up doing was they took these metal teeth and put them into a jig and then slowly pressed them down into cow bones (laughs) because the assumption is these cow bones are of a similar density. Those cow bones didn't stand a chance. No. Well, they did at some of the lower forces. So they used a range of tests. They did 42 different individual tests ranging in speed between 1 and 17 millimeters per second, and then also varying the force a little bit to see what kind of speed and what kind of force the tooth would have needed in order to make these puncture marks in the bone. And they were comparing them to what appear to be juvenile tyrannosaurid marks on an Edmontosaurus centrum, so a vertebra probably from a tail, and on Jane's maxilla, from intraspecific fighting. So some other juvenile tyrannosaurid presumably bit Jane on the face so hard that it gouged out a chunk of Jane's skull. Ouch. Yeah, this this is why I'm glad dinosaurs are extinct. If that's how they treat each other, there's there's no hope. (laughs) Birds aren't that nice either. No, yeah, giant birds with teeth. It's not something I want to encounter. In the end, they ended up with a estimated bite force of 8,678 newtons, or about a ton, which is a lot of force, but not nearly as much as you'd see in an adult T-Rex. The median bite force in order to make similar marks was about 700 pounds, or maybe a third of a ton, but there was a really large range depending on the speed that they used and some other details of how the bite was happening. So they ranged between 450 and 38,000 newtons, which is 100 to 8,500 pounds. So pretty big range. Yep. I just had a thought. So you're talking about the interest species fighting. They don't treat each other nice. But what if, what if we have it all wrong? And I have no idea how we would know. And Maybe this has already been proven wrong. But <laughs> what if animals like T-Rex were just kind of gnawing on each other's faces the way puppies do when they're play fighting. Well, I mean, I guess they could do that, but I don't think they would scratch bone. Mm. Right? This is pretty aggressive. It seems more like something like a walrus 
when they're really going at it, trying to fight for mates and things That's like true. that. They're trying to actually hurt each other. Yeah. But to your point, I think they did mention that maybe that bite on the maxilla might not have been full bite force. So it might have been more of like a warning type bite. Like it wasn't interested in trying to kill the other juvenile tyrannosaurid. So a little bit more like play fighting, but maybe more serious than play fighting, sort of in between like warning fighting, I guess, mm. or something. Yeah. But I, I mean, I was kind of disappointed that they had such a huge range of numbers that ended up working. So they, they reported the averages like I did and then the median, which were pretty far apart. But I guess that goes to show that the biomechanics are complicated and it's hard to get details from just a single bite mark. But they did finish up with a really nice piece of paleo art by Brian Ng, which was a juvenile T-Rex running off with a tail chunk <laughs> of that Edmontosaurus syndrome. So pretty cool. Carrying on with the biomechanics and functional morphology session, there was a sauropod talk by Henry Sai. Yay! <laughs> it was a pause for applause moment. <laughs> I'm going to real quickly briefly go into what the vertebral column is like in animals. I mean, we're pretty familiar with it because we are vertebrates, but in animals that have a horizontal posture or animals in general that have tails is a little bit different than our spines. Essentially, spines in most vertebrates run essentially the whole length of the animal. So it's kind of weird in us because our legs sort of stick down in the same direction as our spine. So we don't really think of it as your spine filling the entire length of your body. But in most animals, that's how it works. And basically from the head, you've got the cervical vertebrae in the neck. Then you have the dorsal vertebrae in the back. It goes between the hips as sacral vertebrae and then continues on into the tail as caudal vertebrae. So that's what we see in dinosaurs. And specifically of interest in this study were those sacral vertebrae. So for us, we have our sacrum. It's in between our hips. It's a bunch of fused vertebrae. And that's essentially where our vertebral column ends. But then, like I was saying, in dinosaurs, it picks up again <laughs> as a tail in those caudal vertebrae coming out behind it. And the sacrum is really important because it helps to distribute stress and it helps with locomotion because the legs are attached to the hips, which are attached to the sacrum and all of that kind of stuff. So it's a pretty important part of the dinosaur vertebral column. In general, amniotes, which is the group we're in, have two sacral vertebrae in our most fundamental ancestral lineage. Diplodocus have sacralization of near tail vertebrae, basically meaning that it looks like those vertebrae are getting included into the sacrum, so there's a lot more than two vertebrae in that sacrum. Patagotitan also appears to have sacralized tail vertebrae or caudals, so it showed up not only in diplodocoids but also in titanosaurs. So all across the sauropods. Well, it's not in other macronarians, so things, I guess, like brachiosaurus might not have them, but some birds do, so it, it just it seems to pop up here and there for different reasons. I think birds have them presumably to make them more rigid when they're flying. Hmm. There's a lot of things about how if they have a stiffer body, they're losing basically like we were talking about with the optimal walking speed and that sort of undulation of the spring motion. Birds don't want much of any of that. They want all the motion to be in the wings and sort of that area and they want the rest of the body to be more rigid so it's not bouncing around and wasting energy. But this study was looking at sauropods, especially diplodocoids, and what they found was that in addition to having those sacralized vertebrae, they might have also had additional cartilage on their long bones, which is really weird. So basically, the biggest piece of cartilage they showed was on the ilium, or one of the hip bones. They had this piece of cartilage that they showed extending several vertebrae down the tail. Hmm. They showed an example of a modern alligator dissection, which had this extra piece of cartilage from the hips running down the tail, and it seemed to serve that same purpose of sort of stiffening and strengthening the tail and potentially helping to serve as an additional attachment site for the caudofemoralis brevis muscle, which is sort of uh, in the thigh area. And it helps them move their tail, right? 
That's the caudal femoralis longus. The caudal femoralis brevis actually goes down and attaches to the femur, I mm-hmm. believe. They said that it probably would have made for more powerful thigh extensions if that was something that the plotacoids had to do. But they also hypothesized it might have been useful for a tripodal posture or tripodal posture. Oh, like when they're rearing up? Exactly. I think you've mentioned this a couple of times in Dinosaurs of the Day where there's a hypothesis that some sauropods might have reared back and then sort of rested on their tail and their back legs in that position. And maybe this huge extra piece of cartilage running down the tail a little bit would have helped strengthen the tail in that sort of position. That's a fun image. Yeah, it's so weird. But it's another one of these examples of when you go to a museum and you see that skeleton of a big sauropod stretched out and you think like, oh, there's the hips and that's what the hips looked like. But in real life, there might have been this massive piece of cartilage sticking off several feet or even meters Mm -hmm. off the back that gave it a completely different structure that just didn't get preserved in the fossilization record. It's like when you think of the claws that we know of, but they're missing the keratin. Mm -hmm. And so it actually would have been much bigger and flashier in life. Yeah, and sharper. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. Another biomechanics talk was by Armida Manafzeda, and she was looking at basically the range of motion that dinosaurs or maybe even other archosaurs could get through in their daily lives. So not just what kind of postures could you hypothetically put an animal into, but more like what are the realistic postures that their limbs could actually achieve. We've talked a little bit about her work. I think at every SVP, she always has really good visuals of everything that she does. This was sort of a correction and expansion on some work she's presented before. I think all of the talks we've seen her do have been on hind limbs. So basically what we're looking at is what kind of positions are allowed by the hip socket to femur joint and then also the knee and the ankle. So how do those bend and how do they interact? Because some of them are mutually exclusive. You know, if you try to do stretches, sometimes if you're bending one joint all the way, you can't bend the other joint all the way because the ligaments just (laughs) aren't going to let you do that kind of stuff. So in order to get a more realistic range of motion, what she likes to do is take x-ray videos of real intact cadavers and bend those around (laughs) so that it's a really realistic sample. And it's not just putting points together in like a computer model and saying, oh, yeah, sure, why not? It could bend 180 degrees because there's a ligament there that actually won't allow that. For this study, she used a guinea fowl, which is basically a chicken and an alligator Because as we know, those are basically the different ends of the spectrum of archosaurs that are still living today. In previous studies, they've ended up with kind of a weird data set that shows a sort of mathematical error. And they ended up using this really fancy thing called a sinusoidal projection, which I guess she said she got the idea from by looking at an old map of Earth that had been modeled using this so that it it looks a little more realistic than a flat map, you know, because rectangular maps are famously distorted. Mm -hmm. But you can do the sinusoidal projection and it looks a little bit more accurate. So she did the same thing using the data of these limb proportions and got a better total range of motion map, which was pretty cool. That is cool. And with her data, she pointed out that All three dimensions of a limb move at once, so you really shouldn't be presenting ranges of motion in one dimension at a time because you have to consider how tilting from the side affects things. And when she watched actual animals move, a lot of times there is three-dimensional movement. When they walk in a straight line, there still can be a lot of twisting motion happening, so it's important to include that. And last but not least in the biomechanics session, there was a paper that we... uh, a presentation we watched by David K. Smith, and it was about Nothronychus. Again, they were looking at the hind limb, so it was the Nothronychus hind limb muscles. Maybe I should say Nothronychus. I know that's preferred by some people. As a reminder, Nothronychus is a therizinosaur. So it's one of the weird ones? Yes. It's just weird in every way, but it's a theropod, but it's kind of upright and it's got the long claws, and it has a, a fairly substantial tail on it, although it is a lot shorter than on something like a T-Rex. Overall, in their reconstruction of the hind limb muscles, Nothronychus ended up with a pretty avian sort of look. 
It has a reduced caudal femoralis and a shorter tail. The femur movement would be reduced based on their modeling. And that also in, contributes to a mass which is farther forward and it gives it more of an avian like stance. So maybe it was a little bit more horizontal than we've previously seen. In addition, the main function of the tail might have been to be used as a stabilizer or possibly for display or maybe both or maybe something else. (laughs) But the tail doesn't look nearly as functional as in some other dinosaurs. We have a couple papers from the bird biology and evolution session because obviously dinosaurs Obviously, birds are dinosaurs, so if you're studying early birds, you're studying dinosaurs. And the first talk I want to mention was by Michael Pittman, and he had by far the best produced video I saw at SVP this year. It was fantastic. And you might recognize his name because Michael created the University of Hong Kong's Dinosaur Ecosystems class that we talk about periodically. It's a free, massively open online course, MOOC. (laughs) We have a link to it in our free resources page on inodino.com because we like it so much. And I think you can still take it for free, but it's one of these things where you get some feedback from the course. So I'm not sure you might have to wait for it to renew for a new season. But anyway, back to his presentation at SVP. He was looking at molting origins, which is not something we talk about really ever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But obviously, modern birds molt to get a new set of feathers because feathers do not last forever. They're made out of pretty delicate materials. However, something I didn't know is that really large modern birds molt in sort of partial molts, and a full molt can take several seasons. So they only do a few feathers here and there, sort of intermixed over time. It's important that they molt because feathers that are in need of molting can impede flying. So as they get older, they're sometimes a little bit funky and they can mess up the flight mechanics. But in order to have the least impact on their flying when they're missing a feather, because that's obviously not great either, a lot of birds do what's called sequential molting. And that usually follows one of two patterns. Either the feathers drop out from the center out, so they kind of go symmetrically out from the middle of the wing or they go outside in so they lose them at the tip of the wing and then it just slowly loses more as they come inwards over the course of time the earliest birds with feathers probably didn't fly so molting likely evolved without a flight pressure so it would be interesting to know whether they had a sequential molt and if they did whether it was center out or outside in a micro raptor that was found not too long ago, was found to have possibly molted based on missing feathers. And it looks like on that Microraptor, it was doing that outside-in sequential molting. And that might indicate that that's one of the ancestral states of molting, because we don't think Microraptor was all that great of a flyer. Falcons, for a comparison, go center out. And that's because apparently the center out molting pattern results in less of an impact on flying performance. If you're losing those wing tips first and then they go in from there, you lose a lot of that tip of the wing Mm -hmm. and that could be a problem. Whereas if, I don't know, I guess when you go center out, it doesn't line up as bad at the end of the wing. Interesting. Yeah. And they do need to fly. (laughs) Yes. Falcons do need to fly. Another animal that likely needed to fly is Archaeopteryx. And that one also appears to have molted But weirdly, even though it was around way before Microraptor, it has a center-out molting pattern, which, like I said, is the same as modern birds that are trying to maximize flight performance. So not only does Archaeopteryx have the oldest record of molting, but it's molting in the way that modern birds molt. (laughs) So I don't know what's going on. It's very weird. (laughs) Dinosaurs did a lot of weird things. Yeah, you can, it shows just how the origins of flight were really messy, that Microraptor, all these millions of years later, was using a less ideal molting strategy than Archaeopteryx was. But it might show that Archaeopteryx was a, a decent flyer, at least. At least it might have been responding to some flight pressures, evolutionarily speaking. 
So also in the bird biology and evolution session was a poster by Case Miller and others. And they talked about analyzing a fifth specimen of Confucius Ornus that was disassociated with the jaw. And they compared the Rampatheca, which is that thin, horny sheath of keratin on the outer surface of the beak, with extant birds, living birds. And they did scans, and they compared also two Confucius Ornus specimens that were found in situ because they needed to re-verify their beak constructions. And they found that the Rampatheca mirrored the underlying bone like it does in modern birds. So the conclusion was that crown birds and Confucius Ornus have some differences in Rampatheca curvature and other features. So when describing non-avian dinosaur beaks, you need to treat it as their own structures and not something that became like crown bird beaks. Interesting. Yeah. When you described the Rampatheca as a horny sheath of keratin on the outer surface of the beak, I was thinking when I've seen Rampatheca described, they just describe it as the beak. (laughs) So that must be that sort of difference. There's more of a distinction between the two. Well, you got the underlying bone and yeah. I guess those 70 plus million years make a big difference. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying with the Archaeopteryx and how Archaeopteryx was weird. It molted differently from Microraptor. Dinosaurs have so much variation that, yeah, we can't just conclude that that non-avian dinosaur beaks looked like crown bird beaks. So enough about birds. Let's go back to dinosaurs. (laughs) It's all dinosaurs. True, but the but, dinosaurs we like, mm, I see. the extinct Mesozoic type that don't fly so much. Oh, that would be funny if cause you're talking about the titanosaurs and the diplodocids that had that, that cartilage to make the stiff tail, and that in modern birds, that stiff tail helps them fly. Like, what if titanosaurs were slowly getting ready to fly? <laughs> that's, that's one interesting theory you got there. <laughs> it's most definitely not right, but... It's yeah. fun to think about. I suppose. <laughs> a little tiny dwarf sauropod on an island somewhere, mm-hmm. shrinking down, developing feathers. <laughs> so we also have two talks from the macroecology and macroevolution session. And the first one I'm going to mention was by Taya Hensler. And I covered a lot of what she talked about in Kat Schrader's talk on body size. It's pretty similar sort of stuff about how when we look at dinosaur ecosystems, there's a weird number of really large dinosaurs and not so many smaller dinosaurs. And that might be because the smaller dinosaurs were filling in these niches, or there's just something else weird going on with dinosaurs. But in her talk, she was looking at herbivores. And basically, they look a lot like the carnivores did, where there's a lot more mega herbivores than you would expect. And in some cases, the mega herbivores even outnumber the small ornithischians. So we have this weird lopsided skewed group of dinosaurs where there's way more big ones than you'd expect in the ecosystem. Somebody did ask her if she thought there was that ontogenetic niche shift that was happening with tyrannosaurids where we think like we were talking about Jane or these other juvenile T-Rex might have been eating a different diet and therefore when they grew up they were filling a different niche so maybe they were gobbling up all that food and filling those niches so there wasn't any room for small ornithischians, but they haven't studied that yet. So in a future paper, they're going to be looking at that niche shifting and whether or not that was going on in mega herbivores as well as mega hyper carnivores. We also saw a talk by Susanna Maidman. They were looking at endemism in ceratopsids in Laramidia, which is basically separate groups of dinosaurs is what you're talking about with endemism. She pointed out that it seems like it's mostly a sample bias because in the past we've talked about how there's this northern group of ceratopsians and the southern group of ceratopsians in Laramidia and maybe there was something in the way like the western interior seaway meeting up with the mountains sort of causing a divide in Laramidia and that's why we have different populations but apparently There might not have been that much of a divide there. There might have been a fair amount of land. And there's a big gap in our knowledge in the northern Colorado, southern Wyoming area. So if we found fossils from that area, it might show that they were mixing together and, you know, maybe not so much of a huge difference between the two populations. 
but we just don't have very many fossils from that area in between those two known groups. Apparently, though, there are rocks available to be explored in that time range in that area, so maybe someone will go out there and find these fossils, and then we can sort of settle this debate on how much Ceratopsians were moving around in Laramidia and whether or not they were intermixing or not. We just have one paper from the Symposium on Dietary Reconstruction, but it's also a fantastic topic, and I love it when there are dinosaur talks about this. They were looking at a lot of people's favorite formation, the Chemchem beds in Morocco. And I should say they, in this case, is Femka Halwerda, and at least she was the one that presented it. I'm sure she has lots of co-authors. The Chemchem beds are really famous because that's where Spinosaurus is from, also where Carcharodontosaurus is from. And there are also quite a few sauropods from there. In her study, she found that there were tons of sauropod teeth, not so much other sauropod bones, but good evidence of sauropods if you find a lot of sauropod teeth. They came from Titanosaurian, Titanosauriform, so Titanosaur-ish things that weren't in the actual group Titanosauria, as well as Robachysaurids. And what they wanted to examine was, because this is dietary reconstruction, what was eating those titanosaurs? <laughs> or were they eating the same types of things? And what sort of trophic level were these animals at? And again, trophic level is basically how high up in the food chain. They should be high up. <laughs> well, probably not because they're eating plants. That's pretty low. Unless you're a big fan of like carnivorous sauropods, in which case they would be high in the trophic level. I was thinking because they're so large, it's hard for them to get eaten. Yeah, that's true. So that it actually does make them higher because it's not like something eats them and then something eats that thing that ate them and so on and so forth. Because it could just be there's only one thing that eats them. And then, yeah, that keeps them, I guess, higher trophically. I'm not positive I got that right because we don't talk about this that much, but... I think that's how it would work. We've talked before about calcium and oxygen isotopes being used, maybe even specifically from the chemchem beds. Calcium helps you figure out the trophic level, and oxygen isotopes help you figure out if they were possibly aquatic or terrestrial, depending on the ratio of these isotopes. So it's oxygen 18 to 16, for example. But in this study, they were looking at strontium isotopes, specifically strontium-87 to 86 isotopes, and looking for a relationship between theropods and sauropods. They found previously that, that strontium decreases over trophic level, at least this ratio does, but they found that it was similar between carcharodontosaurs and titanosaurs, so that's really interesting. Maybe it means that they were at a similar trophic level, like you were saying, Sabrina, or that carcharodontosaurs were largely eating titanosaurs, and therefore they have a similar amount of strontium. But they also said that the strontium ratio can indicate migration. In this case, the large range of ratio that they found, because they had pretty broad ranges, might be because of migration. So they were picking up different levels of strontium depending on where they were over the course of months. So that's just another piece of evidence that we can look at in bones in chemistry to find out more about how they lived. And our very last paper was in the quantitative methods session by Tracy J. Thompson. And I partly included this one because they're from my alma mater, UC Davis. And it's not a school with a lot of paleontology, so it was cool to see them come up. They were looking at claws specifically, and I just thought it was great because it was such a fantastic overview of claws and just how many different things claws can be used for. It's truly remarkable the number of different adaptations animals have come up with for claws. So I just thought it would be fun to go through the different types of claws that they brought up. The categories they came up with were based on function, and even based on that, there are a lot of categories. There was amplectorial, which is for grasping or perching. That sounds very bird-like. Yes, it does, especially on their feet. There's cursorial, which we talk about a lot, for running and or hopping. Griporial, which is for hook and pull digging. There's also scalporial, which is for scratch digging. And at first, I didn't know what example that would be, but that's what squirrels do. <laughs> They're just scratching at the ground, not so much the more efficient 
gripporeal style of digging. Then there's suspensorial, which is just hanging from claws. And that's the kind of claws that sloths have that just look like big old, basically the top of a coat hanger hook. (laughs) (laughs) don't look like the most functional claws but they're really handy if you need to hang somewhere for a long period of time there's also tenosaurial which is a really crazy one that's basically just grappling and their example was cats and how they stick to their prey like velcro so the whole idea is they just get in and stick and that's what the claws are good for if you've ever been playing with a cat and then it decides a fun thing would be to just sort of latch on to this human who's playing with me, you know about this ability to grapple. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are two other categories. One is generalist, which just is sort of in between a lot of these and seems like it's useful for a lot of functions. And then there were even more that they put in the other category, but the 15 minutes at SVP was not enough to go into those. So crazy amount of clause. In order to categorize them, they added more morphological metrics to what we typically talk about with claws. So in general, we'll talk about the degrees of curvature, which is sort of like degrees on a clock sort of thing. You know, like 90 degrees would be curved from noon to three o'clock, that sort of angle that the hand sweeps out. But it doesn't give you a lot of information about the exact shape. So they added a lot more information to it with details about lengths and they converted everything into millimeters because when you're doing principal component analysis you don't want to have multiple different units of measurement so everything was in length that way what they ended up with was finding that most claws are isometric basically meaning that the bone gives you a good idea about what the claw might look like but again cats don't fit that (laughs) spectrum because the bone is really tiny And it just doesn't really tell you much about the sheath that goes over it. Again, cats are a terrible model or analog for most animal behavior because they're very weird. I think they're good to have around, though, because then they keep us on our toes. They do. But the big issue with cats, at least when it comes to dinosaurs, is that a lot of dinosaurs get compared to elephants or other large African herbivores. And the main thing that hunts them are giant cats. So we look at those as like an analog for like, oh, that cat is smaller than the elephant and it can eat it or that water buffalo or whatever. But that's not how like most other animals work. So they're weird. But you're right. It is good to question your assumptions and cats will point out that your assumptions mean nothing to them. They use the model on Archaeopteryx claws. There are two sets of claws on Archaeopteryx. There are the sets that are on the wings slash hands and then there are also claws that are on the feet what they found was that the claws on the hands look like they might have been used for climbing they seem to match those shape characteristics but the foot claws are a little bit harder to determine they're a little more generalist and maybe they were used for running or maybe perching they're sort of in that realm of things so maybe archaeopteryx in addition to having this amazing molting which meant it could fly and all these other abilities Maybe it could also run because that seems to be what its claws look like. So why not just throw that in with Archaeopteryx, make it more confusing for everybody. More cat-like that way. Yeah. (laughs) And now we've finished pretty much all the dinosaur talks from this year's SVP. That was at least all of them that we will cover. There were some fantastic talks that we couldn't cover because there are media embargoes because they're going to come out in papers later. And then there were other ones that we just skipped for time or they weren't relevant enough for dinosaurs. Those upcoming ones are pretty exciting. Oh, man. I can't wait to talk about a few of them. (laughs) We do have a little bit of additional dinosaur news because there's always dinosaur news. So starting with the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, they're celebrating Dinovember because it's November (laughs) with a bunch of virtual events this month. So they'll be talking about Scotty the T-Rex. They'll be giving tours of their paleo lab and more. And there's a lot of information in the article about it on the Observer. So you can get details there and we'll post the link. In Winton, Queensland, Australia, the Australian Age of Dinosaurs has 13 life-size bronze dinosaurs in their dinosaur canyon. I think we saw the plans for these. Yeah. Wow, they're all done with that, huh? Not yet. So they are part of the future March of the Titanosaurs exhibit, but I think there's still more work to be done. Mm. They do have two adult sauropods, one sub-adult sauropod, and then ornithopods and some small theropods. 
13 life-sized bronze dinosaurs. It sounds amazing. That's so cool. I think they had one when we were there, that Australovenator. Banjo? Yeah. Oh, they had some more in the walk, actually, uh, because they have they give you coloring books, mm-hmm. and then you can do these like rubbings on different bronze plaques, but then there are some bronze statues around too. But I don't think there were any sauropods there. Yeah, it was all upcoming for the March of the Titanosaurs. That's so cool. I really want to see an adult sauropod in bronze. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Guess we got to go back to the Outback. Yeah. It's so easy to get out there. Why not? (laughs) In Phoenix, Arizona, Victoria, the young adult T-Rex is going to be staying until January 3rd at the Arizona Science Center. Victoria is about 40 feet long, 12 feet tall, and the skeleton consists of 199 bones. Some of them are 3D printed. Wow. Yeah, and Victoria was found in 2013 near Faith, South Dakota. And based on an absorbed tooth in the jaw and two teeth growing out of the same socket, it's possible Victoria had a mouth infection that came from another T-Rex bite, which then led to sepsis. That's interesting. That's just like Sue we were talking about the other day. Mm Mm-hmm. So I guess that goes back to uh, maybe they weren't play fighting. (laughs) Anyway, visitors can take guided tours. You have to reserve tickets in advance for social distancing. I didn't realize that Phoenix had a T-Rex on display. That's really cool. Yeah, I knew about the Arizona Science Center, but I didn't know about this specific one. 40 feet long is pretty big for a sub-adult T-Rex. Mm-hmm. And last, Atlas Obscura recently posted about the Allaire dinosaurs in Allenwood, New Jersey. So artist Robin Ruggiero has been working in the woods there since 2019, first with a series of huts and then more recently a colony of dinosaurs. (laughs) What? How does a colony of dinosaurs come from some huts? I don't think they're related. (laughs) So, so far there's a T-Rex, Triceratops, and Stegosaurus, and they're made from downed trees, bones, branches, and leaves. And Robin makes them in the woods so visitors can often see and talk to her as she works. Cool. It'd be an interesting side trip to make, go out into the woods and look at these dinosaurs being carved out of fallen trees and put Mm -hmm. together with branches and things. Yeah, they sound really cool. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Rapetosaurus, which was a request from Paleo Mike via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Rapetosaurus was a titanosaur sauropod that lived in the Cretaceous, in what is now Madagascar, in the Mahajanga Basin. It was quadrupedal and herbivorous, and estimated to be 49 feet or 15 meters long. A juvenile was about 26 feet or 8 meters long, and so the estimate is that the adult was probably about twice as long. Not so big for a titanosaur. True. One specimen found is probably an adult, and based on its femur, that one is estimated to be 54 feet or 16 and a half meters long and weigh 10.3 tons. Rapetosaurus had a relatively gracile skeleton. The skeleton has similarities to brachiosaurids and other titanosaurs, so it had a long neck and large body. The forelimb is about 87% the length of the hind limb. It had a slender tail. It had long vertebrae. And... Juveniles didn't really have this, but as an adult, it had osteoderms. The skull was like a diplodocid, long and narrow. An adult skull is estimated to be 15.7 inches or 40 centimeters long, and it had nostrils at the top of the skull. That's cool that they found a skull. That doesn't happen all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. And it had pencil-like teeth, so that means it could strip leaves. Also similar to a diplodocid. The type and only species is Rapetosaurus. Krausi. It was found by a field team from Stony Brook University and members from nearby Université d'Antananarivo. The team leader, David Kraus, had been digging at the site in Madagascar since 1993. It was described and named in 2001 by Christina Curry Rogers and Catherine A. Forster, and the genus name comes from Rapedo, a mischievous giant of Malagasy folklore. That's cool. Yeah, and then the species name, you can probably guess, is in honor of David Krause. The holotype is an adult skull, and referred specimens include a juvenile skeleton and more skull elements. The juvenile skeleton was found directly associated with a well-preserved partial skull. So, Rapetosaurus is one of the most complete known titanosaurs. 
And it helped show what a titanosaur skull looked like. And it also helped show that Nemectosaurus and Chysotaurus are titanosaurs because they're only known from skulls. It also helped shed light on sauropod classification and helped to show what other titanosaurs probably looked like, the ones where only partial skeletons were found. In 2012, Christina Curry Rogers found a juvenile when looking through crocodile fossils at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and she recognized it as a miniature titanosaur because she'd spent 15 years studying titanosaurs. These juvenile fossils were found in Madagascar in 1998 and 2003, but were misclassified. So, Christina Curry Rogers and others did histology and CT scans to figure out how Rapatosaurus grew, and it turns out it grew fast. It grew around the same rate as elephants. So, at birth, Rapatosaurus was estimated to weigh about 7.5 pounds, or 3.4 kilograms, and based on researchers finding a hatching line, In the bones, that shows that there were subtle growth changes after hatching. So in only a few weeks, it grew 10 times in weight. This juvenile weighed about 88 pounds or 40 kilograms. Oh, man. And it was probably between 39 and 77 days old when it died. And it died possibly from starvation due to drought. So compared to a human that at two months old weighs like, what, 10, 15 pounds. This one weighed over 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like a teenager. (laughs) That's pretty amazing. And they weighed about the same as a human at birth. If it was seven and a half pounds, it was a hatchling. Yep. That's amazing. That's how they stayed safe was growing quickly. Seriously. Rapatosaurus also probably didn't need parental care. Scientists think this because the shape and proportion of its limbs appear to stay constant, that isometry. So it looked like a mini adult when it was young. It was precocial because it could take care of itself. Also, the Rapatosaurus weight-bearing bones had signs of bone remodeling, and that's where the skeleton resorbs old bone tissue and replaces it. And that usually happens once animals can move around on their own. So that shows it was moving around. Not stuck in a nest, just waiting for parents to bring back food kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And it had thin cartilage deposits in its growth plates, similar to modern birds that are precocial. So animals that need parental care have thick, irregular cartilages. Hmm. The preserved cartilages also had, according to Christina Curry Rogers, quote, a distinctive structure that signals starvation in living animals. So that's why they think that this particular juvenile died of starvation due to drought. We got more sauropods dying due to drought. We were talking about Mother's Day quarry the other day. True. So this Rapatosaurus juvenile probably spent its time foraging, sleeping, and avoiding predators. Pretty active for so young. The juvenile was about 11% the body size of the largest known Rapatosaurus. I wonder if they go by body length, because it seems like at 88 pounds, it wasn't 11% of several tons. Yeah, it was hard to find some clarification on that. There's a lot of ways to measure size, I guess. So Rapatosaurus lived on an island in a semi-arid climate in an area where sea levels were rising. Other animals that lived around the same time and place included fish, frogs, lizards, snakes, crocodilomorphs, mammals, and birds. And dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included the Titanosaur vahini, Dromaeosaurid, Rahanavis, the Noasaurid, Mashikasaurus and the Abelosaurid Majungasaurus. And Majungasaurus may have specialized in hunting sauropods because there have been tooth marks found on Rapatosaurus bones. So they definitely ate the sauropods, even if they didn't specifically hunt them. In addition to hunting slash eating each other, because Majungasaurus was the first confirmed cannibalistic dinosaur. Yep. And for our fun fact today, I wanted to answer the question, what was the first animal with claws, and like how close was it to dinosaurs, because I assumed dinosaurs would be near the evolution of claws, but I couldn't find an answer anywhere. If you Google, what's the first animal with claws, you don't find any, you find stuff about primates and things, which are not even remotely close to when claws evolved. But I did find some clues. I assumed that Modern claws, when I'm talking about claws, I'm talking about like keratin claws that are similar to what we have and what dinosaurs have. I guess not really so much what we have, but what other mammals have that have more dinosaur-ish claws. 
I figured that that would be from a tetrapod or at least an amniote because the type of claws that you find in the ocean on something like, say, a crab or other invertebrates are really not analogous to our claws at all. They're not the same type of keratin. They're made out of like chitin and then they have muscle inside them and all sorts of weird stuff. So I figured it would be when animals first arrived on land. And my best guess is that it was about 310 million years ago, very roughly sometime in the Carboniferous, maybe about 70 million years before dinosaurs. And it was probably on a reptile or reptiliomorph because they seem to be the first animals I can find that have anything analogous to claws like what modern animals have and what dinosaurs presumably had. But I'm really not sure about that. I'm pretty confident. And part of the reason I'm pretty confident is I found a couple of sources saying that amphibian claws seem to have evolved separately from amniote claws. And there is apparently only one amphibian with claws. I'm not sure if there are any extinct amphibians that had claws. If so, they might be the first one. And it might be a little bit earlier in the Carboniferous when claws first evolved. But the only known amphibian with claws is crazy. So I want to talk a little bit about it. It's called the African clawed frog. <laughs> and its full Latin name is Xenopus lavis. And Xenopus literally translates to strange foot hmm. because it's strange to have claws when you're a frog. <laughs> why would it? Why would a frog ever need claws? It's crazy. For perching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You nailed it. <laughs> I'm wondering how this one would fit into that claw analysis now, too, what the principal components would look like. It might not work out since it probably evolved separately, but it would be good to know. Falls into that other category. Yeah, very probably. Xenopus has three claws on each hind foot, but they have four toes on each kind foot. And the toes are similar in size, but one of them just doesn't have a claw, just to be extra weird. Because we can observe them, we know exactly what they're using their claws for, and they're used for ripping apart food on their hind feet. And this is a frog of similar proportions to frogs that everyone's familiar with. So it's pretty far away from its head, but they use these big legs with claws on the end of them for manipulating their food. Super weird. Apparently, they also sometimes use their claws in self-defense from predators. They'll scratch at things that are trying to eat them. Xenopus is really common in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's completely aquatic. So its legs are used for two things, swimming slash lunging at food, and then also picking apart its food to eat it, (laughs) or tearing apart its food if you prefer. Xenopus is completely carnivorous, which means it is constantly using these feet to tear apart its prey. And after it tears it apart, it uses its front little hands to pick up the food and put it in its mouth. So it's got this weird system where it tears apart food with its feet and then uses its hands to actually eat the food. Why not? It was trying something. It's so strange. But it does make me feel a little silly for saying, why did Spinosaurus have such big claws if it was aquatic? Because this fully aquatic frog is using toe claws in a functional way. There's definitely a good reason for Spinosaurus to have claws on its hands, let alone its feet. Something to look forward to finding out. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app to us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Boom.